So um, it is really an honor to be up here because I'm like the lowliest person among this esteemed group. So please bear with me. Um, one thing, um, I have no financial disclosures, unfortunately. If anyone wants to give me any, please let me know afterwards. <laughs> so the aim of this talk, and one thing I realize as I get older is that I have less data as I get older and I have more opinions. And uh, so what I'll try to do here is give you some data, but mostly tell you what I'm thinking uh, from experience and from just having dealt with some of these questions in my mind. So as we think about pancreatic surgery, um, we, I'd like to go through where our trainees get their experience, what data do we have on open pancreatic resections, what data do we have on minimally invasive pancreatic resections, and then lastly sort of try to put it together as to how we should or are training in, in pancreas uh, surgery. A few disclosures. As Chuck nicely said, I'm an HBB program director. A program was started in 2006. I am president-elect of the Fellowship Council, so I'm really bonded and, and, and passionate about education. I'm a recovering transplanter. <laughs> I did my fellowship in transplant, and any of those that any of you that want to go into um, counseling with me, please, uh, please, please do join me. And as Chuck said, I'm just a country doctor. The question is, what country? And part of that is because I've lived in so many countries in my life, it's hard to tell what this accent is exactly because it changes quite a bit. <laughs> um, so, how do trainees get their experience in pancreas? And I wanted to focus on three areas. One is residency. Second is fellowship, and then the truth is many of us get our additional training during our faculty time. Uh, Residency-wise, as you know, the median number of pancreas cases is very low, somewhere around three in the country. And so really, experience in pancreas is not especially great during residency. In addition, if you look at the score curriculum, these are the procedures that are listed under the essential uncommon uh, area, and Karen probably knows this better than anyone. So, you know, really we're not expecting in the current framework our residents to be trained or be able to do pancreatic surgery. It was different when I finished my residency in 1996. I mean, I feel like I came out wanting to do an APR one day, a Whipple the next day, and a Zenkers the following day. I mean, that was what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and so um, things have changed, and I think we need to acknowledge that the training models have changed. With regard to fellowship training, I'm going to focus on three sort of major ways to train in uh, pancreas understanding that there are other ways, and please understand those of you in the audience, if you trained any other way, that's not, a, that's not to diss that method at all, it's just uh, these seem to be the, the, the major ways that we see these days. The SSO route, the HBB route, and the ASTS route. Interestingly, as with most things in surgery, we tend to, we tend to focus on numbers. And I would love to be able to get away from that at least somewhat. I feel like numbers need to be the floor, but we need to have other measures of competence. Uh, and I would really like to emphasize that we need to understand that there's, with regard to this topic, you need to understand all aspects of pancreatic disease. You heard in Dr. Horvath's talk, that timing of when to intervene is so critical. There's really an art around that and looking at that patient every day and assessing that. So just to look at numbers, so we have the numbers as they stand for the AHBB, AHBB fellowships through the Fellowship Council, 100 total HBB cases of which 25 are major liver, are liver cases, 20 need to be major livers, which is hemihepatectomy, et cetera. And you can see the rest of the numbers. We have increased the number of Whipples to 20 Whipples out of the 25 pancreatic cases. The ASTS um, guidelines are as listed over there. They're a little bit more dubious, and this is over a two-year course, and this is in flux right now, but this is the best numbers that I could find. And the complex general surgical oncology guidelines look at the total number of cases, and I must say the one really nice thing about their training module is that they really focus on multidisciplinary care, which is, I think, something, a page that we can take out of the book, too. With regard to case volumes on the HPB side, um, and I think uh, Dr. Volmer showed some of this data, this is a paper that we put together looking at 
only the programs that had three consecutive years worth of data. And I'm flickering over here, by the way, guys. Um, but you can see that with regard to distal pancreatectomy, uh, we have a median of about uh, 40, uh, excuse me, 18 distal pancs uh, per, per, per fellow, whereas with PD, it was about 40. And, but I do want to understand it's not about the numbers. You've got to understand the disease. And so our fellows and fellows around the country, I expect them to know what SBAC showed. I expect them to know what adjuvant treatment it means for pancreatic cancer. I expect them to know what a dropping CA199 in the neoadjuvant arena means. So with regard to evaluation of the, of the patient, um, I think that this is one of the critical areas that we need to build into training in HBB is not just what operation to do, but who to do it on. And so again, it's the patient's sele se selection, it's, the, it's, it's, it's who to do it on, the nuances of, of, of sequencing of chemotherapy, et cetera, that are important. So what data do we have on open pancreatic risk resection? And I want to talk to you a little bit about the learning curve. Well, it's a tough operation, right? Really tough. I mean, when I started you know, practicing at UT Southwestern in, 2000, in 1997, you know, I had Bob McClellan scrub with me on all of my Whipples because I really didn't have the experience to be doing these big cases, and I knew enough to know that. Plus, at m and it was great because whenever there was a complication, you know, everyone said, uh, Dr. Mack was there, and that was it. No more questions, because if Dr. Mack was there, everything was fine. <laughs> so it's a tough operation. There is a volume outcome relationship, and most really hit their learning curve only after becoming faculty. And everyone refers to this great paper by Jenny Sang, but let me just draw you to the top figure, which is group one is less than 60 cases for the faculty member, and group two was greater than 60. And you can see that in many metrics, there was an improvement after 60 Whipple cases by faculty at that level. Volume for the institution matters, and you know this from the Berkmeyer day data, which I'll show you here, meaning that mortality is less in institutions that do more pancreatic resections. So it's really difficult to take a very difficult, not that common operation and train it and also make sure that we hit our, you know, to borrow a term from my basic science world, the LD50 during training, because we want to hit our 50th, you know, lethal dose before uh, we, we set our trainees out. We did this with lap coles. I really do think we did that somewhat unknowingly at the time where we hit the 40 mark during training. I didn't hit that mark back in 1996, but now we do that. And so I think it's important that we at least hit the 60 mark during open sur 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 surgery during fellowship. What data do we have on MI's pancreas? And I want to shout out to Melissa Hogg, who's in the audience over here, who's just such a fantastic role model for all of us in, in, this, in this area. Again, we're taking a tough open operation. You need additional skills. MIS skills, and have you really passed your learning curve with regard to the disease? And I'm talking about technical aspects, but I'm also talking about the disease. And you must have the volume in order to stay proficient. The question is, is this really realistic, right? So this is the data from Melissa's paper in JAMA. I mean, basically, even though Chuck showed that there is a uh, benefit to having mentors within the facility, let's Let's be, uh, it, most people are not that fortunate to have a Herb Zay or an Amur Zerkat uh, around. So really we have to look at this as that the 80 case um, uh, uh, mark as being probably the point that most of us reach proficiency or at least efficiency. So really we're talking about 60 open Whipples and 80 MIS Whipples. That's a lot of Whipples. And, you know, that, if you look at a high volume center greater than 16, would take 8.75 years. Wow. So how do we do this? I just wanted to show you the data out there on, on um, you know, uh, uh, minimally invasive PD. And you can see, I just wanted to put this up because the numbers in even these high volume places is not that high. So my thoughts. I think we need to reach the open uh, learning curve during fellowship. So I'm actually a proponent of cranking those numbers up even further. 
I think that we need to use every case as a te teaching tool. So for me, you know, when we're doing a Whipple, the trainees, you know, the residents get to do some part of it, you know, hepatico judge, um, gastro judge, mobilization, lead the fellow to do part of it with our trainees, etc. Make the most out of every case. I think the MIS skill set needs to be taught during fellowship also, but we should translate from other operations. So the great thing about what my practice is, I do foregut too, and it's a much easier transition to teach a robotic parasophageal and then go to the, go to the Whipple. I think distal pancreatectomy is doable, as, as, as Dr. Volma has pointed out. I think the whole team needs to get the experience. So what we do is when we have a robot Whipple, everyone scrubs. My partners scrub on it. One is on console two. I usually never have bedside for most of my robot cases, but for the Whipples, we need somebody bedside. We take turns bedside. That way we all have the experience. And with that, thanks to the work of people like Dr. Hogg, Dr. Zerikat, Dr. Zay, etc. We've been able to show that within a 12 uh, um, uh, number, we've been able to drop our operative times, and you can see this on, on this curve. So we're down to about four hours, which is, which is fairly good, I think, for a ro robot Whipple. And that took the village, you know, having all the instrumentation in the room, having the same text, having all of us present, etc. So I've said a lot, but hopefully this will help to just make this confusing topic probably, hopefully, a little less confusing. First, I, I would like to say that pancreas surgery is very tough. You have to understand the whole spectrum of disease. You have to be comfortable with open and MIS uh, surgery. And um, we as educators have to really make an effort to train. So I would say let's make our learning curve at the same time as our trainees' learning curve. That's what I tried to do, and that was my difficulty in going to Robotic Whipple, was how do I stop you know, training for that period of time? So we go together. Thank you so much.